Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. Thank you so much for listening today. I am Eric Christensen, pharmacist, and uh, today I'll be doing a special episode with uh, QTC prolongation and medication use. So this uh, will be a little bit different from the usual format there. Uh, before we get into the podcast, uh, do go check out reallifepharmacology.com. We've got a free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, simply an email will get you access to that and also get subscribed uh, for when we've got new podcasts and content available. So again, go check that out at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, so we do not have a drug of the day today. We have a condition of the day today, and that is QTC prolongation. I've gotten tons of questions on this kind of throughout my career, and it is a challenging topic because, in all honesty, there's there's a lot of gray areas um, depending upon the risk of the patient and that sort of thing. So uh, first off, kind of getting into some basics um, so a QT interval is basically a measurement made from an EKG. It's the distance between the Q point and the T point, and it is reported on an EKG. So, you know, you can do it manually. I think I remember doing that in pharmacy school where we looked at how that's actually measured. Um, in this day and age, it's pretty much on every EKG that I've ever seen. It's reported. So we don't have to worry about that. And, more specifically, the QTC interval is recorded. So that's corrected um, or kind of standardized based upon the heart rate because naturally that QT interval shrinks the faster the heart rate is. So we've got to kind of do a correction factor there. And there's an equation and all that stuff for it. But um, I think it's just important to recognize uh, the values and where a patient is really at significantly high risk with a prolonged QTC interval. So uh, that number is generally considered around 500. And if you've got patients above that, they are at very high risk of torsades, which is, um, you know, it's a very, very rare condition, but essentially the ventricles uh, beat faster than the atria. And obviously this can be really, really bad and, you know, become a life-threatening uh, arrhythmia type situation. So again, very, very rare, um, but I think uh, it's good just to kind of know some basics of uh, why we think about it when it comes to drug interactions and you know, kind of what we think about. So um, before getting into the drugs specifically, uh, there are a bunch of non-medication related risk factors that may put patients at risk for QTC prolongation. So uh, older age, uh, greater than 65, for example, female, um, and if you've got a history of cardiac conditions, you know, CAD, heart failure, uh, bradycardia, you know, any congenital defects, that type of thing, um, those are really um, probably considered non-modifiable risk factors, right? We can't change somebody's age, for example. Um, we can, however, take a look at electrolytes. So low potassium, low magnesium, low calcium, uh, these are risk factors as well. And uh, from a pharmacy medication perspective, uh, you see um, loop diuretics are kind of being the prime example of medications that lower um, potassium levels, for example. So we do we should be paying attention to that and seeing what a patient's electrolytes are and recognizing that if we're you know on the low end or chronically low, um, that can increase the risk for QTC prolongation and obviously uh, ultimately the, the risk for torsades there. But that electrolytes, that's generally fixable. We can replace um, potassium, that type of thing. So just uh, paying attention to that, being aware of that is really important. Uh, renal liver impairment, um, this can contribute to obviously accumulation of some medications that may uh, increase the risk of, of QTC prolongation. So that's always something to think about there. Uh, and then I kind of mentioned, you know, if you've got a patient with a pre-existing uh, QTC interval of greater than 500 milliseconds, uh, that is uh, a significant concern for sure, uh, particularly when we're thinking about starting or adding medications. 
uh, that may add to that risk. All right, so let's start getting into the meds a little bit. I've got quite a few that I definitely wanted to cover. Um, first, I do want to mention that dose and duration matter. Uh, that is a significant issue. So, for instance, if you have you know a four milligram dose of ondansetron given once a week for some nausea, probably not near as concerned about that versus you know, a high dose antipsychotic for schizophrenia, for example. So um, pay attention to that and recognize that, you know, the smaller the dose, the smaller the duration, the less often we give it, uh, that's that's going to matter for sure. All right, so getting in to the medication. So antiarrhythmics are the first thing that I look for and that I think about uh, when it comes to QTC prolongation. Uh, amiodarone is probably the most common antiarrhythmic I see used in practice. And we've got lots of drug interactions uh, with that medication for sure. So that can definitely be problematic when we're thinking about adding new medications uh, because many can interact with that and uh, increase that uh, QTC interval. Uh, other antiarrhythmics that you may see periodically, uh, dofetilide, uh, flaconide, quinidine, sotalol, again, all antiarrhythmics definitely can all increase the risk for QTC prolongation. Uh, antibiotics, let's talk about them a little bit. So quinolone antibiotics definitely come to mind. So you're thinking about uh, levofloxacin, for example, ciprofloxacin, those are within that quinolone class. Uh, another class of antibiotics to pay attention to are macrolide antibiotics. Uh, particularly clarithromycin and erythromycin are considered to be worse or more likely uh, to cause it than azithromycin, uh, but azithromycin has been associated uh, as well, maybe to a slightly lower extent there. Uh, azole antifungals, so um, kind of within the, the realm of antibiotics and antifungals, um, ketoconazole, itraconazole are notorious uh, for increasing that QTC prolongation risk, uh, as well as having a ton of uh, other drug interactions themselves. Uh, so that's definitely uh, a couple of, of meds there to, to pay attention to. Uh, and then we've got antipsychotics. So uh, this is always a, a good um, higher level board exam question is, you know, which antipsychotics are worse or better um, for QTC prolongation or that cardiac risk. Uh, on the low end of the spectrum, uh, you've got aripiprazole, tends to be the least likely um, to contribute to QTC prolongation. Uh, and on the high end of the uh, spectrum, zip ziprazidone tends to be one of the worst as far as QTC prolongation. So uh, like I mentioned, always a, a good, good question as far as uh, board exams go and recognizing, uh, you know, maybe a patient in a case that already has you know, prolonged QTC interval, but we really need or want to get them an antipsychotic. Um, that's, we, we try to mitigate that risk and we try to select those medications that are least likely uh, to impact that QTC uh, interval. So in that case, it's like you would lean towards aripiprazole or maybe some of the other ones that, you know, aren't as strong and obviously avoid uh, drugs on the high end of QTC prolongation, such as uh, ziprazidone, like I mentioned. All right, um, antidepressants. Uh, so antidepressants in general, most of them have been associated in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but again, there are some subtleties and some nuances here. So um, TCAs as a class probably tend to be the worst as far as QTC prolongation. So, you know, your amitriptyline, nortriptyline, medications like that. Um, with the SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, the ones that have historically been most associated with QTC prolongation, uh, citalopram has probably been the worst, and escitalopram is probably uh, up there as well, maybe a little bit less. So with that, you know, again, if we've got a patient at risk, we're going to go through the list and try to look and find um, an SSRI that you know, maybe has a lower risk of causing QTC prolongation. 
You're also going to try to limit dose and duration, you know, whenever possible and things of, of that nature as well. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and I'll wrap up with my last three drug interactions as well as kind of a summary uh, on uh, strategies for tackling uh, QTC prolongation drug interactions. If you're in the market for any pharmacist board certification study material like NAPLEX, BCPS, ambulatory care, BCGP, BCMTMS, go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a growing list of resources updated annually. Uh, we try to stay current with the uh, content outline that does change periodically for each of these exams. So uh, again, go check that out. Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, if you're a nurse, physician, med student, dietitian, we've got tons of other content available. Lots of Amazon books, uh, case studies, clinical pearls, um, drug interaction case studies, food medications interactions book, uh, crossword puzzles to help you learn pharmacology and other things like that. Um, all those links can be found at meded101.com slash store. All right, so wrapping up QTC prolongation drug interactions. So um, I've got three more that I wanted to specifically mention, um, but I also wanted uh, to mention the website CredibleMeds.org. Uh, they have tons of info on QTC prolongation and medications that can cause it, contribute it to it, because obviously I'm not covering every medication that can contribute to QTC prolongation. I'm just highlighting some of the most important things that I've seen uh, in my clinical practice. So uh, with that said, uh, the first one of my last three is methadone, not used terribly often. And, you know, it's particularly bad if dosages uh, go up and up and up, get way higher, which again, doesn't happen very often in practice anymore. Um, but I definitely wanted to mention uh, this long-acting opioid uh, within the, the context of QTC prolongation. Uh, another medication or class of medication is triptan. So these medications are used as abortive therapy in uh, migraine management. So these drugs can obviously uh, can contribute to QTC prolongation. Uh, but again, dose and duration matter. So, I mean, if we're only using it, uh, you know, once a month, for example, to uh, manage a patient's migraine and they're younger and they're at low risk for QTC prolongation, you know, it's probably a situation where you're not quite as worried about it, you know, and you're maybe not going to monitor it uh, quite as, as closely there as you would in somebody that's that's older, for example. Uh, and then some of the nausea medications, um, obviously, drugs that can uh, block dopamine or maybe have antipsychotic type activity uh, can increase that risk for QTC prolongation. Um, but some of the other nausea medications, such as ondansetron, um, that has also been uh, associated with uh, QTC prolongation. So may need to monitor that there. Again, PRN use, if it's not being used very often, it's something that I'm generally not as as concerned about there. So with that, let's tie that into some of the strategies that I use when I uh, see a patient on maybe one or two meds that can uh, prolong that QTC interval. So first and foremost, what are the strategies? So um, do nothing. So if you've got you know, maybe a younger patient that's very low risk, um, you know, electrolytes are all normal. We don't have any other risk factors, no heart you know, defects, no heart failure, no CAD, uh, no cardiac insults of any sort, uh, that's probably a pretty low risk patient. And if you've just got that patient on, you know, one medication, for example, let's say they're taking that triptan for migraine periodically, you know, it's a situation where I'm probably not worried about it. Okay. So again, look at that, look at that situation. So good, good example of that, let's say you've got a younger patient, and maybe they've got some anxiety or depression and they're taking escitalopram or uh, generic for Lexapro. Uh, they're taking five milligrams a day, very low dose, that type of thing. And they get prescribed azithromycin for, uh, you know, an ear infection or upper respiratory infection or something. Um, that's a very low risk situation. And you're probably not, um, as long as you see that they don't have any other really cardiac risk factors, 
um, that's a situation where you're probably not going to uh, check an EKG, for example. Um, but you know, you do similar things and you add on a couple more meds in an older patient, then it's like, okay, maybe we better get a little bit more aggressive with monitoring and, and what we're doing here. So, um, so that's one strategy really, you know, do nothing if they're a low risk, uh, type of patient. Uh, another strategy, uh, pick an alternative agent. So let's say you've got an infection and we're using a quinolone antibiotic and, you know, maybe they're on amiodarone, maybe they have some other risk factors. Well, is there another antibiotic we can select that would adequately cover their infection and not have as much risk at uh, prolonging that QT interval? Another strategy, uh, if you've got to have those medications, you think you need to use them regardless of the the situation, we don't have any alternatives uh, that are, are relevant or decent or maybe, you know, prolong that QT interval to a lesser extent, um, that's a situation where you may just simply monitor. You may look at the EKG, um, get a baseline, say, hey, where are we at with this? Obviously, make sure that um, we're managing any risk factors that we can, so making sure those electrolytes are normal as well, um, that may help reduce that risk a little bit. Um, But there you might check an EKG before and after. So let's say we wanted to start citalopram in a patient um, that's on, you know, an antiarrhythmic, for example. Now, for whatever reason, you know, we couldn't select another antidepressant um, or, you know, they had tried a bunch of others or whatever the case may be and we really felt like we had to go with citalopram. It's like, okay, then we're probably just going to monitor that QTC interval and make sure it's okay. Kind of with, you know, that 500 milliseconds kind of being our our guide. When you get to the upper 400s, you're starting to get a little bit more concerned you know, above 500, uh, that's definitely more and more concerning and increases that risk of torsades uh, more significantly. So monitoring, definitely another uh, potential strategy for dealing uh, with these uh, drug interactions. Uh, and then, of course, you've got assessing the risk versus, versus benefit based upon the patient's risk factors. So is it worth it? you know, to use that citalopram in that situation? Or can we continue to try, you know, other non-pharmacological things, depending upon what the indication is that we're using it for? Um, That needs to be thought of as well. Again, you're probably going to have an EKG at that point and recognize whether they're, you know, already maybe moderate to high risk for this issue. Um, But again, kind of that constant reassessment of the risk versus benefit of the medication uh, compared to what it's doing to the uh, QTC interval. So those are some of my kind of top strategies um, and top drug interactions when it comes to QTC prolongation and how to manage that. Um, Hopefully that gives you uh, a sense of kind of what to look out for and things to think about uh, as you're addressing uh, each case on a case-by-case basis there. So Hopefully this podcast has been helpful. If it has, please leave me a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. All the uh, purchases there go directly to support this podcast. Greatly appreciative to those of you who have done that already. Uh, And if you've bought a book uh, from me that uh, I've written and you've enjoyed it, found it helpful, I'd greatly appreciate a rating and review on uh, Amazon as well. So uh, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, If you have any suggestions for future podcast episodes, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me at mededucation101 at gmail.com. I do my best to respond to uh, every email I can. And uh, with that, I'm going to sign off for today. And I thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.